This is Joyce DiDonato, and I am responding to a lovely invitation that was extended to me by Miss Rich for her Elk Point Jefferson 6th grade classroom. First of all, congratulations you guys. I hear you had a big concert, and I hope it went really well. I hope you had a blast. But Miss Rich has told me that she has started introducing you guys to opera. How cool is that? You guys have a rocking teacher. That is fabulous. She did tell me that you were perhaps a little bit uh, skeptical, a little bit like, hey, what's this opera thing? And she stayed with it. Brava, Miss Rich. My big compliments to you. But she stayed with it, and pretty soon you guys were like, hey, this is kind of cool. Well, welcome to my world. I just am so excited that you're getting the chance to explore this exciting world of opera. I think it's wonderful and I think it's endless the amount of discovery that it can bring to you. You guys have very kindly sent me some questions and I'm so happy to answer them. Um, I just ask a little bit of patience and indulgence in case I actually misrepresent or mis, uh, mispronounce your name. Uh, please don't hold it against me and if I do then you can start calling me Jane or something. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you have beautiful names. The first one is Jezenia. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's how you would maybe pronounce it in Italian. I think it's beautiful. Jezenia would like to know, did you dream of becoming a famous opera singer when you were a kid? I didn't. I loved music. I loved being on stage. But opera singers, to me, sort of, um, they were like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and I didn't really, that was my terrible prejudice against opera singers. I didn't really understand it. Um, but I started getting a little bit into it and studying it a little bit, and I was blown away at how it's anything but that. Um, the human body is an absolutely perfect instrument. And that's incredible. Not only is it keeping us alive and walking us around the earth and um, letting us learn things, but then we can create music. And once I figured that out, I was hooked. So I actually dreamed of, of doing other things, but not being an opera singer. So here's, that's a little advice for you. Just stay open because you might surprise yourself about where you end up in your life. So this is a compact question from a several singer, uh, a students. Sam, Aubrey, Parker, and Madison would like to know, who was your inspiration to sing opera? I went to college, like Miss Rich, to be a, a music teacher. And so I did student teaching there as well. I was really, really fortunate to get amazing teachers in college that inspired me to take this further and learn about this. So it's not so much that I saw a famous singer and I thought I want to be like them. It was from the people in my life that encouraged me and um, introduced this to me. This Because it's a world that I didn't really know existed before. So I think they're the ones who ultimately inspired me to do it. Athena, wow, that's a noble name. Athena, Grayson, and Megan would like to know, how did I become a famous opera singer? Am I famous? <laughs> I, I'm famous perhaps in a little itty bitty tiny corner of the world. Um, and it's a wonderful world. Um, but it's a world that... Um, is a little bit far away from the rest of the world. Um, but to get to where I am today, I worked and I worked and I worked and I continue to work. Um, it took me about 10 years of really solid training and a lot of those years involved a lot of failure, a lot of rejection, a lot of coming in fifth place rather than first place. Uh, in competitions or getting a really secondary role way in the back. Maybe I had one line out of the chorus and my other friends were getting the lead parts. 
Um, so it was, it was encouraging enough for me to keep doing what I was doing, but I realized I still had a lot of work to do because I wasn't coming in first place and I wasn't getting the lead roles. So I worked. I worked really hard. And it wasn't until I was about, oh, gasp, 30 years old, and ancient, right? Until I was about 30 years old that I really started kind of coming into my own. So it was a lot of years of struggle and training and hard work. It was good. Uh, Tristan, you know there's an opera about you, right? Only it's spelled with an I, and you spell your name with a Y, but it's a big, epic love story about Tristan and his old. So that's a great opera name. Um, if you want to be an opera singer, where do you start, and does it take a long time to be famous? Well, being famous was never my goal as an opera singer, because that's a pretty hard thing to shoot for. But I did want to be the best that I could be. And that did take a long time. Like I answered in the previous question about 10 years of really solid training. But here's the thing, I have to keep studying. I have to keep working and keep this going. Um, the best analogy I can give you is that opera singers are exactly like athletes. So you look at um, your favorite NFL player or NBA player, and you look at how long they've been playing football or basketball and how hard they've worked and how much effort they put into their college years and how long they slaved away maybe in like the minor leagues and baseball before they made it to the majors. It's the same thing for opera singers. So there's a lot of training, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to build up in ourselves and we have to keep at it. So it's a, it's a profession where we constant, constantly keep studying. Um, Zed would like to know, were or are any of my family members musical? I think maybe if you are musical at one point, I think you're always musical. So yes, they were and they continue to be. Uh, my father was the volunteer church choir director where I grew up. And he met my mom because she was the organist at the church. And so we grew up in a really musical household. Um, seven children, and I'm number six. And uh, my two older sisters were classical pianists and studied in college. And so we had a lot of piano happening in our household. I grew up playing piano too. And my brother was listening to heavy metal rock, ACDC and Aerosmith. And I was listening to pop music. And my dad was listening to big band music and choral music and classical music. And so it was a household that was full of all different kinds of jazz. So I've grown up loving all different kinds of music and just happily, opera is one of them. Carly would like to know, is it hard learning to sing in a different language? Very. Do you know, I'm in rehearsals now for an opera called La Donna del Lago, which means the Lady of the Lake at the Royal Opera House in London. And I'm still getting corrections on my Italian. And I'm still learning how to make it even better. Even though I can sing in the language pretty well, uh, there's always room for improvement because it's not my native language. Italian, I can do pretty well. French is really hard. They have, the French have all these sounds in their language that we don't have in English. Sounds that they call nasal sound. Oh, ah. Mm, it's all very sort of in the nose. Um, it's a beautiful language. When you sing the French, it sounds like you are going like this. It goes on and on. It's beautiful. But it's very hard to learn to do correctly. So a lot of my time isn't just spent on learning how to sing. A lot of my time is spent on the language. It's where, um, it's where the fireworks happen as a singer in the words that you're saying. And it tells me how to kind of paint the line that I'm doing. It's where the emotion comes from. Yeah, I, t I have a lot of fun with singing in different languages. Hannah would like to know, other than singing, what happens backstage to make the opera possible? Whew, okay. So there has to be somebody who imagines the set 
That's going to be the playground where we tell the story that goes on stage. He has to design it like an architect designs a house. And then there have to be carpenters that actually build the set. And there have to be painters that actually paint the set. And then there are prop people that they call what they they call dress the set. Means they put a rug on the floor and they hang a painting and they put flowers and they dress the set. Then there are costume people. Somebody's designing the costumes. They're a fashion designer. And then there's somebody who's making the costume and sewing the buttons and tailoring it and taking it in or letting it out for us. There's somebody who's making wigs for us to wear and dyeing the hair and curling the hair. And there are people backstage calling out orders so that the people who have to pull the big set pieces in from the ceiling, they know when to go. So they're what they, we say, calling the show, saying, lights come on, go. Uh, armoire, come in, go. There's somebody up in a lighting booth making all the lights happen. Then there's a conductor down in the pit who's keeping the 75 orchestra musicians in the orchestra pit and the 10 singers up on stage and the chorus of 40 keeping us all together. And there's all those chorus people and all the orchestra people and the ushers who are coming and the general director who's deciding who gets to sing what roles and people who are figuring out how the, what the posters look like and what the tickets look like. Whew, it's exhausting. And I think that's one reason opera can be kind of expensive is because there's a lot of people that work there and a lot of people that aren't seen in the spotlight, but that are super responsible for it. That's a great question, uh, Hannah. Matthew would like to know, have you ever made a mistake during an opera performance? No, never. A lot. But the key is that you don't, you don't want the audience to know that you've made a mistake. See, we're human, and we come and we prepare really well, but live performance is really scary. There's a lot that can go wrong, and it's amazing that more doesn't go wrong. Um, I think you guys know about this. There's a famous t moment in my life where I fell on stage. Well, there have been several moments where I've fallen on stage, but that's another story. But this particular one, I actually fell and I broke my leg. But I kept going. And the thing was, um, we continued to tell the story and I continued to sing. And yeah, it was a bit of, not exactly a mistake as it was more of an accident. But the thing is, things happen in real life too. And so we just keep going and pretty soon if we do our job, the audience will never remember. But, you know, mistakes happen. Okay. What is your favorite opera? Asks Colin. Colin? That's such a hard question. It's a good question, but it's a hard question. I don't have one. Because I kind of figure every piece that I work on is a masterpiece. You have an opera by Mozart, an opera by Puccini, an opera by Rossini, and these are geniuses. These are composers who, ah, they're genius. They're putting together three hours of music that tell a story and that's beautiful and it's pretty incredible. So usually my favorite opera is what I'm working on at the time and right now I'm having a lot of fun with this opera here in London. Uh, final question from Lily. If you didn't sing opera, what would you do? Okay, this is a hard question. What would I do? I, so I studied to be a teacher. I could imagine myself teaching in some way, but I can also imagine myself um, maybe doing something else on stage, like a, maybe being a, a plain stage actor. I would love to be a dancer. I'm not really a dancer. Um, something that puts me in touch with other people, I think, is what I would do. Something in communication because that's what I love so much about opera. Um, we get the chance to connect to other people. If you think about it, I'm singing today here um, the music of Rossini that was written, you know, almost 200 years ago. And you think, 
I'm, I'm, I'm doing something that puts me in touch with another. It's like I'm time traveling. It's in a way like I'm time traveling and I get to transport that music to an audience in 2013. And I just think that's pretty remarkable. Um, one of the things that I think is so great about opera is it's one of its most important goals and premises is to be beautiful. And I think one of the things that can make me a little bit sad if I think about it in today's world is I sometimes wonder if we're missing beauty around us. Um, and I think the world can use more of it. And I'm not talking about superficial beauty, you know, um, a supermodel who has perfect face or I'm talking about people that are beautiful, somebody who smiles and somebody who falls in love and somebody who laughs and um, that kind of beauty that makes you feel like you understand yourself a little bit better and you can maybe see the world in a slightly different way. And I think when opera is good and when opera is at its best, that's what it does. And so I feel so lucky to be a part of that. And if I wasn't doing opera, I would search out something else in my life that um, sort of did that for me. Could be photography, could be writing, could be painting, um, teaching, yeah. You all owe a big hug to Miss Rich. Brava, Bella. You've done a great job. Um, thank you so much for bringing opera into these wonderful students' lives. You guys are so great to write these questions. Now it's your job to go out there and spread the word and introduce other people to opera. And hopefully, I really hope that I will see you in an audience one day and I'll be able to sing for you in person. Okay? You guys, all the best. I know summertime is coming up soon, so you be safe. Have a good summer. And uh, congrats again on your concert. I hope you had a ball with it. Okay. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.